Good evening, everyone. Before I begin the presentation, I just want to take a moment to find out if everybody, everyone can hear me and see me. I've enabled the chat. It's in the left-hand side of your screen, or on the left-hand side of your screen. I just want you to type in yes if you can hear me. Please and thank you. Oops. Can everybody hear and see me? Please type in yes if you can. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, great. Thank you. There's still some more people coming on. I'm going to start this promptly because I have a lot of information to cover tonight. Um, so just bear with me because I think I want to share. So good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending the Naturally to Hangout. This Hangout is going to be awesome. I've got some great information for you about the max hydration method. This method of hydrating the hair that is, has taken the natural hair community by storm, um, specific to a specific hair texture and, and, and curl pattern. So I just wanna get into that with you. And remember, during the Hangout, I'm going to disable chat because I'm not gonna be able to see the information or the questions that you have. And after the Hangout, I'm going to enable the questions, the Q&A section, so you'll be able to ask your questions. So without further ado, let's just get into the material I'm going to present. Just bear with me, everybody. Okay. So tonight's hot topic is the max hydration method. So let's just talk a little bit about what this is going, this is all about and the purpose for it. So it's a five-step regimen that systematically increases moisture levels in the hair until max hydration is reached. This is the same concept as the curly girl method. However, it's the most ideal regimen for low porosity hair, type four hair, and type four C hair, as these types have the most difficulty absorbing moisture, and curly girl techniques alone don't account for the hair types. Now I'm just gonna add that the information I'm presenting to you is from the creator of the max hydration method. So this is not from me, this is from the creator of the max hydration method. So what it is, who it's for, the uh, ingredients and the products that you use all come from the creator of this method. The regimen does work for all hair types, and if you don't fall into the category of either low porosity or type four hair, you probably can be a, a bit more lenient on the products you can use and take modifications as you feel your hair needs. Try to use your own intuition when it comes to your hair as well. For example, some people might need a little bit more protein. Now, once max hydration is reached, many of the issues that affect type four hair in terms of moisture, styling, knots, and length retention don't occur. Lastly, max hydration allows even the most tightly coiled 4C hair to curl from a root to tip with no product. Sounds great and interesting, right? Well, let's take a look at what it entails. So I'm just gonna play this video here. and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'll be discussing what is maximum hydration. The maximum hydration method is designed to cater to ladies and gentlemen who have type four hair. Initially, this 
method was designed for type 4 hair with low porosity. However, those with normal or high porosity can also use this method, but they'll need to tweak it to their own hair needs. This is because PPQ, the lady who came up with this method, has low porosity hair. However, another YouTuber who has successfully used some of these methods with their own hair and has reached maximum hydration, I can a fit girl has, I think, normal or high porosity, and these methods have worked for her. Type 4 hair needs um, this to ensure that it is getting enough moisture into the hair cuticles because out of all the hair types, it has the hardest time retaining or absorbing moisture. Also, uh, most people within the type 4 are usually also low porosity, which means that you have a hard time absorbing moisture into your cuticles. You are going to be reintroducing moisture on a regular basis um, using certain techniques consistently until you build up your moisture retention levels to a point where you have optimum hydration levels or maximum hydration. Okay, so you get an idea of what the method is about um, in that video clip there. So just a few points I, I just want to make sure that you are aware of. She said that type 4 hair tends to have low porosity and that where you're absorbing moisture is in to the cuticles. Now, as per the person that created this method. So those are the things I kind of want you to take note of. So now let's get into the details of the method. Now, you're instructed to do the steps in the exact order, and you're not supposed to skip any of the steps or else it will not be as effective. Don't use any drying products. And for the first week, these steps must be completed every day. This is considered to be a one week challenge. So the hair needs to be done every three days and you are not to go past five days without doing it. And what we're talking about in terms of doing it is this, this regimen from the step one to step five. Don't attempt to go five days without doing the regimen until you have reached 70% hydration in terms of your overall hair. The regimen works by the number of times you complete the full regimen. So the instructions are to do your hair, wear it for three days, and then repeat the entire regimen again. They note that not all of your strands will reach maximum hydration at the same time, but they will get there. So the pre-step to step one is the Cherry Lola Caramel Treatment, and this is a do-it-yourself treatment. This is done on day one of the challenge, and it's optional. So after the seven days are completed, it can be done as often as every two weeks or as often as you'd like. The Cherry Lola Treatment replaces the Clarify step on the days that it's done. If you have low porosity hair, you may have heard of the Cherry Lola treatment. It's a treatment that was named after a natural hair vlogger who created this treatment and her name was Cherry Lola. It's a mild protein treatment, they say, and it contains yogurt, baking soda, and amino acids in the form of Bragg's liquid aminos. It's used to help lift the cuticles and help the hair have an easier time absorbing moisture. It's known to help boost moisture levels and eliminate frizz in those women who have used it. There's another treatment called the caramel treatment, and it is supposed to be a deep penetrating treatment that's known to hydrate and restore life to the hair. It contains honey, olive oil, bananas, molasses, and apple cider vinegar as some of its ingredients. <clears throat> and this treatment can also be purchased from a company called Etie. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's E apostrophe T-A-E. So that is the caramel treatment. The creator of the Max Hydration Method combined the two treatments to form the Cherry Lola Caramel Treatment. In the Maximum Hydration Method, this treatment is used to jumpstart the absorption of moisture. And this is why it's recommended that you, um, <coughs> excuse me, that you condition or steam your hair overnight with a conditioner right after you do this Cherry Lola Caramel Treatment. It's not recommended that you clarify your hair after this treatment as it would defeat the entire purpose of it. 
Remember, if you're doing this pre-step one, this Cherry Lola Caramel treatment, it's going to replace the Clarify step. So you don't want to do this in addition to clarifying. If you do this, you're going to move on to step two, which is co-wash and finger detangle. If you're not doing this step, then you'll begin your regimen with clarifying. So in terms of the step one, if you're not doing a Cherry Lola treatment, you're going to start right here with clarify. And this step involves using baking soda or apple cider vinegar as a rinse. For the baking soda step, there are two options. The first one is to mix one to two tablespoons of baking soda into a thick conditioner to use one to two and a half ounces of water and then shake. You'll apply this to the hair in sections and let it sit on the hair for 10, so sorry, for 15 to 60 minutes. And if it's being done on product feel, uh, free hair, um, they say that you should feel um, and you, you feel the hair stripping, sorry, then you should reduce the baking soda to one to two tablespoons or teaspoons. The option two is two tablespoons of baking soda, two tablespoons of honey, one tablespoon of olive oil, and six to ten ounces of water. Then you're going to leave that on your hair for 15 to 60 minutes, and then you're going to rinse. Now you have also have options to do the apple cider vinegar rinse. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. The apple cider vinegar rinse, you're going to do a one-to-one -one ratio of apple cider vinegar with water in an eight-ounce applicator bottle. You're going to apply it to the hair from a root to tip and let it sit on the scalp for 15 to 60 minutes before you rinse. You can cover your hair with a baggie and a satin scarf. Now you can do the apple cider vinegar rinse for 15 minutes but the longer you can leave it sit, the better. And there's another option, you can do either rinse every other day or night of the week. It's up to you to experiment with how often you want to alternate. So step two, after you've clarified your hair, is to co-wash and finger detangle. And there are a few options that they give where this step is concerned as well. So the first option is to apply conditioner to your hair in sections and deep condition overnight by covering your hair with a shower cap or a thermal heating cap or use whatever form of heat that you want to add heat to the hair. This will be one to two ounces of conditioner and four to eight ounces of water in an applicator bottle so you're watering down the conditioner. And in the morning you're gonna rinse out this product and it's gonna function as your co-wash. Now, on days that you will not be able to complete all the steps for whatever reason, you're simply going to stop here. You're going to keep the shower cap or on underneath your, your wig or scarf or beanie or whatever it is that you're using until you can complete the rest of the steps. And they say that this will prevent you from having any setbacks. It doesn't count as a full day until you complete the rest of the steps. The second option is to apply the conditioner put on a shower cap and then steam. You're gonna steam for 15 to 20 minutes under a steamer. This will function as your co-wash and again, you're gonna use about one and a half to two ounces of conditioner, four ounces of water and an applicator bottle. Now the third step is to apply a warm conditioner on your hair in section. Let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes under the shower cap and rinse out. This will also function as your co-wash. If you're doing this step, you want to pour one and a half to two ounces of conditioner into an applicator bottle and then warm it and then apply it to your hair. So no matter what option you choose, you have to finger detangle before and or during your co-wash under the warm shower. And you want to section your hair before going to the shower if you can, if it's long enough to do so. And you want to focus on removing shed hairs. You want to smooth and rake and separate the tangles in each section from the root of your hair to the tip. So now the third step is the clay rinse. And this rinse can be done using any pure clay powder like bentonite clay, rasool clay, red clay, European clay, or French clay. You use a funnel or a folded paper when needed and you can pour each ingredient one at a time into a large empty bowl or shampoo bottle. You wanna shake and you wanna mix the ingredients together. Now after you use it, they can store it for the next day. And if the clay dries up, all you need to do is add a little bit more water and shake. So the ingredients that are typically in the clay rinse are a cup of pure clay powder, two to three cups of warm water, honey, and olive oil. 
Now, if the consistency is too thick, you want to add more water until you get a liquidy consistency. It shouldn't be so thick that it's cakey or solid. And the second option is to purchase a ready-made clay rinse. Now, what they say is that if you use clay rinses or if you're using any products in this regimen, they have to be maximum max hydration method approved. Um, they, they're saying that they put more than just clay in these rinses. For, so watch out for no-no ingredients that I'll get into a little bit later, like glycerin. Also, many people find clay rinses that include aloe vera juice to be more stripping. This is because aloe vera juice is also an astringent, they say. So you may want to stay clear of aloe and conditioners. In gels, it should be okay since it will form a cast and seal in moisture once you've applied enough. The higher the aloe is on the list, the less hold the gel will probably have. So if it's the first ingredient or only holding ingredient in a gel, keep that in mind. Now, I want you to keep those statements in mind about the glycerin being a no-no ingredient, that aloe vera juice dries out the hair and strips the hair and it's an astringent. Uh, I want you to keep in mind the fact that they're saying that if the aloe vera is high on the list um, in the gel, it will probably have less hold because I'm going to come back to address them a little bit later on. With all the options that you have for the clay rinse, you leave it on for about 15 minutes before rinsing, and you want to remember to evenly distribute in sections. So it should look like the pictures that you see when you apply the clay rinse. They say correctly, and the clay is not evenly distributed, your hair might actually feel dry. So when applying the mixture, you want to try to separate coils. Don't try to smooth it on your hair in a, one big, thick, slab but apply it in layers much like you would do with a gel if you're applying a gel to to do a wash and go so you kind of want to shingle it through your hair so if you leave it on 15 minutes you can do that or you can leave it on a little bit longer and then you want to rinse out the clay and so this is the part of the method where you'll be checking for signs of maximum hydration they say your hair is now going to be completely clean of any leftover product residue, and you'll be able to check your progress on your product-free hair. So they're saying that the coils will be felt at the scalp first while washing your hair. You will then start to clump and curl at the very tips of the hair and slowly progress up to the root, which is when you can claim maximum hydration. Other visible signs of maximum hydration include shakeable hair even when the hair is wet, or sorry, even when the hair is completely dry, after having completed all the steps. And they're saying that this is the added weight of moisture retention. If you're doing this regimen and, and transitioning, you just want to check your new growth for signs of max hydration. Now, the fourth step is the leave-in conditioner. And it's one to two ounces of conditioner and five to eight ounces of water in an applicator bottle. So constantly watering down the conditioner. You want to get to feel for the consistency, consistency you want. You want it more watery or you might want a little bit thicker but whatever consistency is best for your hair you want to apply it to each section of your hair you want to think relax your application again raking the hair and smoothing it through apply enough so that your hair feels wet you want to concentrate on the base of your hair and then the tip and work it in then bring it down to the rest of your hair shaft the wetter and more slippery your hair feels the softer your hair gel will dry so keep that in mind so the thing to note about this regimen is that they always talk about applying a conditioner from the root to the tip. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind as well. You will also wet your hair right after you rinse out the clay step and apply the water down leave-in all over your head first, focusing on the roots. Then you're going to wet your hair again, shake and section with clips. So a lot of water here, a lot of re-wetting. And you can re-wet and add more water conditioner if the area is not wet enough. From then you want to go to step five. So step five is the addition of a botanical gel and there are two options. So when you apply the gel, you should be putting enough so your hair feels slippery along the hair shaft and that way you know it's evenly and thoroughly distributed on the hair and it's properly sealing in the moisture before the gel cast forms. So this gel cast that they're speaking about is basically what happens when the bonds in the gel form. So a, a, a gelling substance is a polymer. So the polymer forms bonds with other hair strands and you get clumping and some gels, gels will form like a, a cast or the, the harden, uh, so to speak. So this is what they're talking about in terms of the gel cast. 
apply the gel from con um, concentrating on the roots of the hair first, working it in, then bring the product from the roots to the tips, making sure to smooth and thoroughly rake your fingers through your hair. Otherwise, it might clump in sections that are too big and it might frizz. The second option is to use a small amount of oil for extra sealing before or after the gel if you find you need it for a softer hold. Now, they're saying it's not entirely necessary because you can control the softness of the gel cast by the amount of conditioner you apply in your leave-in step. And you can layer products by using the lock method or LCO. Um, so it just depends on what's best for your hair in terms of how you're going to apply your liquid, your leave-in, sorry, your conditioner and your oil. There's also the option, depending on your hair texture, to use a cream-based gel. So now the regimen is complete. So I just want to show a video on how the gel is actually applied to the hair. This is Dee and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'll be demonstrating how I do the final step of the maximum hydration method regimen and this is the wash and go. Okay, everyone, hang on. I'm just having a few technical dif difficulties here. So let's try this again. There we go. You gotta love technology. how I do the final step of the maximum hydration method regimen and this is the wash and go. I'll be using my watered down conditioner, watered down gel, a water bottle filled with warm water, and some hair clips. I start from the back in small sections and I clip the rest of my hair away and then I take my watered down conditioner and I apply it to the roots and I smooth it in making sure all my hair strands are thoroughly coated with the conditioner from root to tip. I water down the section in order to remove the white residue from the conditioner. I then start applying my gel from root to tip, smoothing it in, making sure all my hair strands are coated. And I take enough to make sure that it feels slippery when I'm applying it on my hair strands. And then I move on to the next section and I do the same thing. Okay, so you got to get a sense there of how she does her, her wash and go. So pretty much she's putting the watered down conditioner in her hair, then spraying it with water, and then adding the gel. Okay, so that's how you would want to do your wash and go if you're using this max hydration method. So how do you maintain your wash and go according to the max hydration method? Well, there's a there's several options and there's tons of YouTube videos and such out there. I just a couple to, to discuss. So one is you can section your hair into vertical um, sections, so four to six vertical sections like uh, rolling your hair or more depending on the hair's length and you can tuck and pin them in place with a bobby pin. So that's what you're seeing here. Another option is clipping and you can take as many sections as you need and you can uh, French roll and clip it in place with a shower clip or some other type of clip and leave it like that for 30 minutes or more as you get dressed and then take the clips out and then you shake and this should give the hair a slight stretch. So those are only two methods. I know when I used to do wash and goes uh, and my hair was longer, I would just basically uh, band my hair or take my hair in four sections and put some elastic bands on it to stretch it out and, and that worked for me as well. So there's so many different methods and techniques that you can look into if you're interested in extending your wash and go. So now let's see what the science has to say about the max hydration methods. methods. And the first thing I wanna review is this concept of porosity. So it describes how easily water and other substances can move back and forth through the cuticle 
and into or out of the cortex. Hair can absorb water from the environment and it can also lose moisture and fats to the environment. And so the key to healthy, soft, manageable hair is the ability for your hair to maintain an optimal moisture balance, which is basically what the max hydration method is trying to do. Now, porosity is a function of the cuticle. So moisture is not necessarily a function of the cuticle, but porosity is. So let's examine that. There are a number of factors that determine porosity. And the cuticle is probably the most important hair structure in moisture balance. The scales of the cuticle are flexible and they overlap each other. And this type of configuration allows oils and moisture to move into and out of the hair. Two factors determine your hair's porosity. The first one is how tightly those cuticle scales adhere to the surface of the hair shaft. And the second factor is how close adjacent scales overlap each other. Now hair can be classified as having low, medium, and high porosity. So let's take a look at low and high porosity in a little bit more detail. Low porosity hair characteristically has a tightly bound cuticle. The individual scales lie flat and they overlap each other. This is the hair type and texture that can be resistant to chemical processing. And this is important because low porosity hair yet held water when you attempt to wet it. I've seen um, women with low porosity hair whose hair looks like, like wire. I can't describe it any other way. The water just seems to bead up on the hair and not really penetrate through the cuticle into the cortex where it belongs. This hair can appear shiny and is considered healthy. Now, when it comes to low porosity hair, it's more prone to excessive product buildup and the accumulation of protein, which can make it feel stiff and straw-like. So low porosity hair will typically require products that are high in moisture, humectants, and emollients. I need you to remember these terms. They need Low porosity hair requires products rich in moisture, which will be water or water-based based um, ingredients, humectants are difficult to rehydrate and restore proper moisture balance because there are very few openings in the cuticle or they're small. So the next one that sorry everybody technical difficulties just bear with me okay so since this regimen is specifically for type 4 hair what i want to do is i want to review the characteristics of type 4 hair according to the global texture typing system as used by chemists and researchers and specifically Dr. Ali Saeed, who is a chemist for Avalon Industries. So Avalon Industries is the company that manufactures the Cara Care products. Okay, so he kind of knows his stuff. So I'm taking the information from, from him and, and his resources. So type four hair characteristics um, are typically, the texture of type four hair is fine. So that's the hair that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. It tends to be very coiled, has a high tendency to frizz, and the moisture content tends to be very low. But this is what I want you to focus on. The porosity is high. Type 4B, which is the image that you see in the middle, the texture tends to be medium or coarse, meaning the hair strand thickness is medium or thick, medium to thick. Tends to have more Z-shaped curls and a tighter coil than type A. Again, the tendency to frizz is high, the moisture content characteristically is very low and type 4B hair has high porosity. And type 4C, which you're seeing on the end, coarse texture, very kinky coils, it has like the tightest coil, fr high frizz, the moisture content is very low and the porosity is high. So wait a second, as per the max hydration method, Type 4 hair, and you saw um, in the YouTube video, the girl said that type 4 hair tends to, in general, have low porosity. But according to this system, and some pretty credible scientists, type 4 hair characteristically is high porosity. 
So there I've got a little bit of an issue with this method in that there's inaccurate information in terms of type 4 hair texture. Now I'm not saying that people, some women with type 4 hair do not have low porosity hair. They do, for sure. But in general, it seems that it's characteristic of women with type 4 hair to have high porosity and not low porosity as outlined in the regimen. So that is the first issue that I'm, I'm kind of having with this max hydration method. Now let's discuss high porosity hair for a moment because it's typically the result of chemical processing, harsh treatments, environmental exposure, and heat. And all of these external factors can cause irreversible damage to the cuticle layer. And what happens is there are gaps and there are holes created in the hair shaft. The hair is then prone to damage from other sources. And as the hair becomes more porous, what happens is there's stress and there's weaknesses that are created in the hair due to the hair absorbing a ton of water. So the hair absorbs a ton of water, there's stress and weaknesses throughout the hair strand, and this causes breakage. High porosity hair also tends to absorb a high amount of water than normal or low porosity hair, so about 55%. So the thing that you want to keep in mind is characteristically with type 4 hair, this hair texture tends to be higher porosity. And the challenges with high porosity with respect to water is that it can absorb too much water and lead to breakage. Again, something to, to keep in mind here when it comes to this regimen. So my issue that I have is that type 4 hair is characteristically low porosity as per the video, and this is incorrect. So because of that now, this type of regimen is outlined for low porosity hair. It would definitely need to be changed for high porosity hair. So let's examine the steps. The first step I wanna assess is the Cherry Lola treatment. Now this involves yogurt, baking soda, and amino acids. And so the person that developed the treatment basically use two parts of yogurt, and she says it's for the protein and the conditioning properties. Half part baking soda, she says to make the hair more porous, and half a part amino acids, just to see what effect this, the amino acids would have to this treatment. Now for the caramel treatment, the purpose of the treatment is a deep penetrating treatment to hydrate and restore life to the hair. So it contains honey, which is used as a humectant to draw moisture into the hair. Olive oil is a humectant, a great humectant and a great oil. Molasses, and some say it's for the protein and apple cider vinegar for clarifying. So basically the Cherry Lola treatment and the caramel treatment are combined for the Cherry Lola caramel treatment. Okay, so that's basically why the treatment is added to the regimen in the first place for protein and for conditioning. So let's talk about protein for a minute and let's, let's dive into the science a little bit of protein. Proteins are found in virtually every living system and they're the main components in hair, skin, tissue, and bone. They're also um, involved in the immune response, so they're very important. Now proteins are composed of amino acids. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side where it says primary structure, those are the individual amino acids that make up the protein. Now, they're held together by different bonds, and as the bonds form, you get this structure over on the right-hand side, which is the quaternary structure, which is assembled units, okay? So all you need to know is that proteins are made up of individual amino acids, and through bonding and different configurations, you get a quaternary or fourth-degree structure to the protein. Now, the proteins have four levels of structure that help them in the performance of the function for which they're designed. So the building block of protein is that amino acid. So I just wanna emphasize that. So in terms of protein and cosmetics, they've been used for a long time. They absorb, adsorb, adsorb, readily onto the surface of the skin and hair, forming films that help to retain moisture. The films act to smooth and flatten the cuticle, which makes the hair shinily, shiny and more easily detangled. And these films slow down moisture loss and also provide some protection from environment and pollutants. Proteins really like to attract water molecules from the air. So that would, that's what gives them their humectant properties. And they're added to bleaching or perming solutions. Um, and when they're done, 
um, sorry, when they're added to perming and bleaching solutions, they help to reduce damage from the cuticle. So remember, proteins add Zorb, AD Zorb onto the hair, and they form a film that helps the hair actually retain moisture. Whole proteins are too large to be useful, and they're not easily to incorporate into body washes or shampoos or other hair products. So what chemical companies do that sell proteins is that they break them down into smaller units that are more soluble and easier to work with. And this process of breaking down big proteins into smaller pieces is called hydrolysis. So these hydrolyzed proteins are then put into formulas. Amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, they're too small. So proteins act by adsorbing to the hair. And adsorb means the protein sticks to the hair and forms temporary bonds with the hair. Very large proteins can't form these bonds reliably. And amino acids, on the other hand, tend to be very soluble in water. So you can expect that you'll remove the majority of whatever you put on your hair once you rinse it from your hair. So let's use egg as an example. I know it's not part of the Cherry Lola treatment, but I'm using it as an illustration. Many people like to do masks, DIY masks with eggs and mayonnaise. Well, the protein part of the egg has a molecular weight of approximately 33,000 to 40,000, too large for it to be useful on the hair. It so happens that anything within the molecular weight of 2,000 to 10,000 is the right size for the protein to be incorporated into the hair. So egg white is too big. And then when it comes to the amino acids, um, I in Bragg's, which, is, which comes from soybeans, I tried to find some information on the molecular weight of soybeans and couldn't really find any reliable sources. The only thing I saw is that basically it's around or higher than the 33,000 to 40,000 um, in molecular weight. So it's, it's gonna be too high or it might be too high to be incorporated into the hair. So when you're using Bragg amino acids, I would say, just use it for a soy sauce replacement, to be very honest. So there's, I, I don't see any value in adding Bragg's amino acids to the hair for a mild protein treatment uh, because it's not doing what people think it's doing in terms of adding strength to the hair and getting into the cortex of the hair in order to fortify that hair structure. So this is why I kind of took a little bit of time to go over proteins because most people use these ingredients like the yogurt and the amino acids for protein. But the reality is, is that they're not really doing anything to kind of fortify the hair structure. They might be doing some great things to actually condition the hair and seal the cuticle and help with softening the hair. But in terms of a protein treatment, it's not doing that. So I briefly want to discuss pH in hair. Before I discuss the apple cider vinegar and the baking soda, so I know I'm, I'm you know, moving along a little bit slowly, but I just want to make sure that you understand these concepts first so you can understand why certain ingredients are incorporated and whether or not to leave them out if you decide to try this method or a rehydration method that I'm going to talk about next week. So pH is an abbreviation for potential hydrogen, and it's a scale that's used to rank the relative acidity or alkalinity of a solution. Essentially, what it's assessing is the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. So this is a pH scale that you see here, and it's a scale of 0 to 14. Anything below 7, anything that's in the kind of the red to orange zone is acidic, and anything that is in the green to blue zone is alkaline, with 7 being neutral. So in order to understand where the apple cider vinegar and the baking soda come into play in this regimen, we'll need to examine the pH and hair. Human hair is made up of strands of fibers made of keratin protein, which contain specific amino acids. And those amino acids are glycine, alanine, and cysteine. Now, cysteine contains sulfur, and it's responsible for what are called disulfide bonds. And those disulfide bonds are those permanent bonds in the hair. These are the bonds that are broken when the hair is chemically relaxed. Okay, so they're, they're very permanent un unless they are relaxed with a, a chemical. These contribute to the overall strength and elasticity of the hair strands, as well as curl formation. Proteins are made up of many amino acids linked together in a chain, and they're gathered and folded in other structures. And due to their chemical structure, 
proteins are capable of possessing either a positive or negative charge, and it depends on the local environment. Now, there exists a pH at a given temperature where the molecule is completely uncharged or neutral. And this is known as the isoelectric point. And the isoelectric point for human hair is optimally a pH value of 4.0 to 4.5. So the isoelectric point is the pH at which the surface of the hair carries no net electrical charge. So this is where acidic solutions become important in hair care. The hair and skin are both covered by a very thin fluid layer made up of oil, salt, and water, and this is what's known as the acid mantle. It's slightly acidic, a pH of about four and a half to five, and it's extremely important in maintaining proper moisture balance in our hair and skin. And it's essential for making the cuticle scales lie flatter against the surface of the hair shaft. So what happens when the cuticle scales lie flatter against the surface of the hair shaft? Well, it causes the hair to be smoother and shinier. Light is reflected better. And if the cuticle scales are held tightly, this can minimize the loss of moisture, helping to improve the strength of the hair. The acid mantle can become contaminated or removed with washing and everyday styling and exposure to the environment. So it's important that it's restored with pH balanced products. So when we're talking about the use of acidic versus alkaline products with respect to hair, products that are mildly acidic can be applied to the hair to harden the outer layer, flatten the cuticles and reduce swelling. And the result is glossy hair that's less prone to tangling. Alkaline products, on the other hand, which are typically what you're on the right of this diagram here, they cause the hair to swell, the cuticle to lift, and the removal of oils from the hair. So this can result in frizzy, dry, and brittle hair that can tangle and break. Extremely alkaline solutions, like ammonia or lye, can break the disulfide bonds in the hair and dissolve the protein. And this is how chemical relaxers work. In the case of high pH products like permanent colors, relaxers, and bleach, Penetration of the ingredient occurs through layers of the swollen cuticle. Shampoos and conditioners tend to penetrate through the channels between the cuticle layers and then through the junction of cuticle layers and the cortex. So there are a few things that can raise the pH of our hair. Um, structural damage from processing or rough treatment, the use of basic solutions on the hair such as perming solutions, relaxers or baking soda, soap bars, soap containing detergents. Hair at a higher pH, is negatively charged and has a more swollen and porous structure. It also has lifted ruffled cuticles that contribute to a dull, frizzy appearance, the tendency to become tangled and a higher likelihood of breakage. So the take home message is that hair at its isoelectric point has a tight structure and a sealed cuticle layer on the outside of the strand. And hair that's close to this pH is at peak strength. So let's get back to the discussion on baking soda and apple cider vinegar. The Bragg liquid aminos is a healthy alternative to soy and tamari sauce in terms of consuming it. And the liquid amino acids are made from soybeans. And the Bragg liquid amino acid contains the essential amino acids. So it doesn't contain all of them, just the essential ones, which are the amino acids that your body requires and it's not able to produce. So it's difficult to find a lot of info on the molecular weight of soy protein, but some sources say it does have a high molecular weight. So it could be likely that the amino acids, the Braggs, are really not beneficial to the hair at all. Now, sodium bicarbonate or baking soda is a popular cleansing method among naturals and women with low porosity hair. And don't get me wrong, some women are getting amazing results using baking soda rinses. A few tablespoons of baking soda are usually diluted in water and then applied to the hair. And women report that their hair is softer after cleansing with baking soda. And I even had uh, one woman tell me that her daughter does baking soda rinses and it seemed to relax the hair. And that would make sense, I suppose, if baking soda is a high pH and can actually start to kind of release some of those bonds a little bit. Excuse me, the pH of baking soda is alkaline. So remember what alkaline substances do. They open up the cuticle. And for low porosity hair, this might not be such a bad thing because part of the problem with hydrating low porosity hair is the fact that this cuticle tends to be so tightly bound. The pH causes the cuticles to lift and the hair shaft to spell open. And the rinse can be done after the shampoo process. 
For low pro C hair, this may help improve the penetration of moisturizers into the hair due to the, cut uh, the lifted cuticles. Now, it's important to note that there's very little change in the structure of the hair between the pHs of 4 to 9. So if there's a substance that has a pH between 4 and 9, the hair is not going to really change much in terms of its chemical structure. The cuticle begins to lift at a pH of around 10. The natural pH of baking soda is around 10, so this might account for some of the effect that women are experiencing with baking soda rinses. It's also important to understand that for some, baking soda can be abrasive to the hair. So while it can definitely be an option, you might want to use it with caution and, and really mix it really well. Apple cider vinegar is made by adding sugar, yeast, and bacteria to apple cider. This process ferments the cider into an ethanol or alcohol solution. And then what happens is the bacteria convert it to an acetic acid solution, which is basically vinegar. The cloudy and sometimes slimy portion of apple cider vinegar is the dead cells of the batch times referred to as mother of vinegar. Now, it may be useful as a rinse for several reasons. Acetic acid is a mild chelating agent, so it can be useful in removing mineral deposits and buildup on the hair that accumulate over time due to hard water. The clarifying properties of apple cider vinegar and other vinegars can also help remove wax buildup and sebum. And for this purpose, you'd want to use about 20, 25 to 50% vinegar. Rub it into the scalp and leave it on the hair for a few minutes, giving the product time to work. So it would, it would be a pretty concentrated solution of vinegar, um, barely diluted with water. Vinegar can also be a pH adjuster for the hair when diluted with water and used as a rinse. Your hair needs to be in the proper pH after cleansing and conditioning because it affects the overall health, appearance, and condition of your hair. So in this case, how you could use the vinegar is after you cleanse and condition your hair, do an apple cider vinegar rinse to bring that pH back down again to its isoelectric point. It has a pH between two and a half to three and a half, depending on the type of vinegar and the concentration. So using it as a final rinse for your hair before conditioning may be a great way to lower the pH of your hair, to lower the isoelectric point or slightly below it. And so what happens is this allows the hair to be sealed flat with a smooth outer layer of the cuticle scales, making it shiny, less tangled and more manageable. Now it's important to keep in mind, vinegar, vinegar can be drying. So um, don't use it frequently, okay? Or if you do use it, you want to use it with a good conditioner. So in this case, what you would do to bring the hair back to its isoelectric point, shampoo, use the vinegar, then condition, and then moisturize and seal. So when it comes to the apple cider vinegar rinses, you can try it a few different ways. You can try it before you condition, or you can try it as a final rinse after you condition and gauge the results if you choose to use this. So now let's examine the role of clay in this regimen. Restful clay and bentonite clay are two popular types used by many naturals, and they're typically used in spa treatments for mud wraps. They're mainly used for cleansing. The clays are able to attract small dirt particles to themselves and hold on to them, and the clays typically attract positively charged ions. The clay and the ions that it has held on to can then be washed off, and they can, some of them can also remove heavy metals such as lead. Clay masks have also been used for curl clumping. When the mask goes on, it tends to attract adjacent strands and clump the curls. The effect could be temporary or more permanent depending on the texture. So if your hair texture is the type of texture that does not clump without product, then it's very unlikely that after you rinse the clay from your hair, your hair is going to remain clumped. If your hair texture does clump, without product, like for example, you just have to use conditioner on your hair, then yes, having, having the clay rinse can definitely help to increase curl retention and formation. So let's take a look at the two clays, the Rasul clay and the bentonite clay. So Rasul clay is sometimes referred to as Moroccan gasul clay, and it's naturally found and organically mined from ancient deposits in Morocco. It's known for its unmatched ability to absorb impurities from the skin and hair and give the skin and hair highly beneficial minerals. It has a high content of silica, magnesium, very high amount of magnesium, potassium and calcium. And it can also absorb a lot. As a hair treatment, Moroccan Rasul clay cleanses the hair, removing impurities and leaves the hair 
bouncy and with a lot of body and a lot of volume. So claims for Rasuo clay for the hair include being a moisturizer and a softener. It can help reduce dryness while also removing toxins and product buildup. It can improve the hair's elasticity and unblock your scalp's pores. It can reduce flakiness and aids in detangling. The next clay is bentonite clay, and it's composed of aged volcanic ash. It's an impure mud, and it's powerful at its ability to produce an electric charge when it's added to water. So this charge can help remove positively charged products from the hair and body and absorbs and removes toxins, impurities, heavy metals, and chemicals from the body. Now it's considered to be a healing clay. Again, it has a high concentration of minerals like calcium, iron, magnesium, potassium, and silica. And there are several different types of bentonite clay, each named after its dominant element. So the main use for the bentonite clay is as a detoxifier for the hair. Although I do put that in quotations because hair is not living, it is dead. Um, that's um, coming up from the follicles. So really when it comes to detox, that process, if I'm gonna get really nitpicky, is a physiological process of living things in the body. So I put that in quotations. Um, I guess the better way of saying it is it can help remove impurities from the hair. It can really help to cleanse the hair and it can help to restore the hair's pH balance. This is some of the claims um, that some people make about it. So what is my opinion of the max hydration method? So does it work? Well, there are a lot of women and some men too that have used the max hydration method with some amazing results. So there must be something to it. So how does it work and, and what exactly is going on? Well, there's no study done to show the level of water in the hair before and after the max hydration method. That's the only way you'd really be able to understand, you know, how it's really working. So there are some assumptions that can be made about how the, the method actually works. It's interesting to note that the hair has a limited amount of water it can accept. It will reach this limit within 15 minutes of being completely drenched with water. In essence, to keep the hair hydrated, you need to create a humid environment around the hair that forces water to stay in the hair. So this method may help the hair retain moisture by keeping the levels more in balance with humidity. The hair is almost constantly surrounded by water. Remember, you have to do this method for the first week every three days or so. So you're constantly surrounding the hair with water from start to finish. So what tends to be happening or could be happening is it the, the moisture levels in the hair are more in line with humidity. And so a regular washing cycle combined with the use of a leave-in conditioner and a layer of gel to actually seal, I, I don't want to say seal in moisture, but to lock in the moisture can prevent the moisture loss between cycles. Now this method has a list of approved conditioners and gels based on the creator's evaluation of product ingredients and formulas. And this is where I think there needs to be some clarification. <coughs> Excuse me. So here are the list of no-nos, and I've got the product, what the max hydration method says about it, and what the facts are. So the first one that's a list of no-nos on ingredient list of a product that is MHM approved is TEA or triethanolamine. So what they say is that it's a drying alcohol derived from ethanol. It forms lysine-based products and dissolves certain types of hair after long-term use. Well, here's what it actually does. And if you use gels quite a bit, you're probably, you might see TEA in the ingredient list. TEA adjusts the pH of whatever gelling agent is used. It's usually used along with something called a carbomer. So what the TEA does is it, it's a pH adjuster and it brings it back down to a neutral region so that the gel can actually form. And it's known to help form very clear gels. Most often you're going to find the TEA and Carbomer listed together. And these two are the backbones of most commercial gels. So what happens is the TEA is added to water to adjust the pH and Carbomer helps to turn the liquid phase into a gel. So that liquid phase could be water or it could be aloe vera juice or some type of other liquid ingredient that the manufacturer wants to turn into a gel. So that is why TEA is used in gels. So what they're saying is it, it, it tends to be drying to the hair. The next one is hydrolyzed wheat protein or peptides and they're saying it's bad for low porosity hair and most kinkier type 4 hair. What are the facts 
about the hydrolyzed wheat protein. It's a film former. I spoke about proteins earlier. Uh, proteins are humectants and they help repair the hair. They can help increase moisture levels in the hair. In my opinion, hydrolyzed proteins are a curly girl's best friend. Now, there are some individuals who might be quote unquote protein sensitive. And even, you know, for me, I would need to go a little, a little bit deeper in my analysis or assessment to find out if it's the protein that they're sensitive to or some other ingredient in the formulation. But Proteins are great, especially with helping to moisturize the hair. So I should, I would not stay away from them. So I question why this ingredient specifically is on the list of no-nos. Another one is panthenol, which is basically pro-vitamin B5. What they say is it builds up and acts like a protein. So what are the facts? There's a persistent rumor that panthenol creates a waxy buildup on the hair. There is no evidence to support this. Panthenol is not at all similar in structure to any waxy material. It's water soluble, mildly soluble in glycerin, and it's, it can be mixed into most oils. So it should be easily removed from the hair by rinsing or washing with a mild shampoo or even co-washing. If you're experiencing problems with buildup, then it could be the other ingredients in the formulation. Panthenol is readily absorbed by the skin and it's a precursor to vitamin B5. And so when it's used in shampoos or conditioners, Panthenol improves scalp health and can potentially improve hair growth. It's a humectant, it's an emollient, it helps give shine to the hair, it's moisturizing. So again, for a moisture protocol, I really don't understand why this ingredient is a no-no. The other one is glycerin and propylene glycol. They're very similar, but I'm going to address the glycerin because it tends to get a really bad uh, rap. What they're saying is that glycerin pulls moisture out of the cortex in dry conditions, and glycerin is also an astringent. So glycerin, you know, it's one of those uh, ingredients that your hair might love or your hair might hate, but it also depends on the formulation that the glycerin is in and how it's used. So it's a very simple substance. It has been used for many years in cosmetics and personal care, and it's a remarkable moisturizer for, for skin and hair. New studies have shown that its amazing abilities are now into the regeneration of skin cells, which is amazing. Um, it also helps to reduce hair breakage. So it's a molecule that absorbs water from its surrounding environment. And it has such a high ability to attract and hold water molecules that it will raise a blister if it's applied to it undiluted. If it were applied to the hair undiluted, let's say you buy the glycerin at the store and you just apply it to your hair, it could strip all the moisture from the interior of the hair. That is how powerful it is. However, and this is important, when it's used in a diluted state, it is a great moisturizer. So when you add the glycerin with water or you combine it with so many other ingredients, it is fabulous at moisturizing the hair. And what matters with humectants, especially glycerin, is the environment they're used in and the other ingredients it's paired with in order to ensure adequate moisture. Okay, so another set of ingredients is polyquats. Um, what they're saying, it's just another version of silicones. What are the facts? Well, polyquats are cationic polymers. They're positively charged, which means they're going to really adsorb onto the negative charge of the hair, form a film, and help condition the hair. Very, very effective at being uh, conditioners. Now, depending on the polyquat, removal of the hair may or may not be difficult. So their concern with the max hydration method is that it might cause buildup on the hair. And that could be true depending on the polyquat that is used. So, I mean, I don't want to really get into a lot of detail about um, each ingredient, but I just kind of want to debunk some myths here. There is some, in, there is some agreement that I have with them saying that it can build up on the hair, but it just depends on which polyquat is used. So they're saying in general, don't use them. That's not always the case. Um, and the, the thing is about the max hydration method is that they don't use shampoo, they use co-conditioner uh, washing. So there are some ingredients with some polyquats being in that category that cannot be removed with just co-washing alone. Okay, so that statement about just another version of silicones leads to a ton of buildup. It might be true depending on the polyquat that's used, but they're highly beneficial to the hair. Silicones. 
what they say is that can call, cause buildup. They can't be removed without sulfate shampoo. Well, no, this is not necessarily true as you cannot generalize all silicones. There are varying types of silicones. The facts are that the removal of buildup when it comes to silicones, there are different studies that show that silicone molecules are almost 100% removed from the surface of the hair when a shampoo containing sodium lauryl ether sulfate, ammonium lauryl sulfate, ammonium lauryl ether sulfate, or, I know those are kind of harsh, the more gentler cleansing agent, coca metopropyl betaine was used. That's from coconut. That's more of a gentle cleansing agent. So if you use that one, then that can remove silicones from the hair. Now, there is some evidence that if you plan to just co-wash your hair, then no, you might not want to use silicones because they might not be removed from just conditioning washes alone. Okay, so there, yes, there is some information and some agreement that I have that silicones can build up the, the hair. And if, 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 if on the max hydration method, we don't want to use ingredients that are going to cause a lot of buildup just because we're not using shampoo on the hair, then yes, yeah, silicones might be out. Now, the cautions are a little bit, to me, a little bit perplexing. Aloe vera juice and coconut oil. And anybody who knows me, knows my products, know that I use aloe vera juice in every single product. I am proud to say that I do, and I use coconut oil in every single product. And my products are very moisturizing. The Earth Tones Naturals products are extremely moisturizing. So I was a little bit confused with the whole aloe vera juice and coconut oil and the reasoning that they give for both ingredients is that they can leave the hair feeling hard. Well, what are the facts on aloe vera juice? It's a humectant. It has moisturizing properties. I don't understand how it can leave the hair hard. I, I really don't understand that at all. That baffles me. The coconut oil. Yes, I've heard people say that it can leave the hair hard. It's And it's usually people that use the coconut oil by itself, not mixed in anything. And they use it in the colder weather because coconut oil at room temperature is a solid. And if you put it on your hair, just like that, and you go in the cold or cooler weather, yes, it could leave, it could dry hard. But it doesn't mean that using coconut oil mixed in with other ingredients is not beneficial. This oil search, it's a great oil for helping to prevent cuticle chipping and minimizing hygro fatigue. It gets absorbed into the cortex of the hair, improving the manageability of the hair. So to me, I completely disagree with not using or being cautious about using aloe vera juice and coconut oil. I think those are the two ingredients that if you really, want, really, really want to effectively hydrate your hair, those need to be incorporated in some way, shape, or form. So I, I completely disagree with this, these, these statements here. So overall, I think that the max hydration method is a great method to improve moisture retention on the hair. I think um, there's some there's a solid foundation for the use of certain products. However, the reason for avoiding some ingredients is questionable and requires a more detailed assessment of the product formula. This is so important. I'm a big believer in this. You have to assess the totality of the formula. You can't just pick up one ingredient and say, my, my hair doesn't like this ingredient. Well, how do you know? Have you used that ingredient on your hair in a high enough concentration to get a reaction? Because typically with studies, that's what they do. They're not gonna use an ingredient in a formula and pick out the out of 50 ingredients that one ingredient that's causing a problem what they'll typically do is use that specific ingredient to gauge the reaction so this is a big issue with me when i you know hear people say this ingredient makes my hair hard i've used it in a product but i can pinpoint this specific ingredient how do you know it's not the formula as a whole so this is my issue with the assessment of those ingredients that are those products that are approved on the on the uh, protocol and those that are not approved, it doesn't make any sense. So if that's the case now, I, I just have to kind of question everything else. So that's just me, that's just me. So it's important to understand that ingredients behave differently by themselves versus being combined with other ingredients in a formula. Glycerin is a perfect example. You use glycerin at high concentration, it can suck the moisture from your hair. You use glycerin in a diluted form, it can be the most moisture retentive product you'll ever use. So it just depends on how those ingredients are combined together. The formula is the key to assessing whether or not the product will contribute to dryness or not. The method as is seems to be more beneficial for women with low porosity hair. 
That does not necessarily mean type 4 hair because as we saw, type 4 hair characteristically is high porosity. That does not mean that women with high porosity hair cannot benefit from the formula, from the method with a few tweaks and modifications. So it can be great for enhancing curl definition. As you saw, it's amazing at bringing out those coils in type 4 hair. The cons are it takes a lot of time. You're looking at days and days of doing this, this, um, this method. The hair needs to be wet every few days and it may not be good for some environments. Like if it's really, really cold outside, do you really want to be going out with your hair wet all the time? Probably not. And there are some possible concerns with messing around with the, the hair's pH level too much. So you're opening the cuticles, you're closing them, you're opening, closing. So there might be concerns there. Um, but the reality is, is that there's a lot of women who have seen so such tremendous benefit from this, this uh, method and their hair is been hydrated for the seven days. Now, after the seven days, it's difficult to know, but during that seven days of wetting and, and uh, co-washing, et cetera, they seem to have really good levels of hydration in their hair. So that is my assessment of the maximum hydration method. Does anyone have any questions? I'm just going to enable Q&A. Oh, and what I will say is next week, I'm going to let you all know of the uh, rehydration protocol. If you've heard me speak before, if you've seen my webinars on the seven day rehydration protocol in the past, it is going to be a little bit similar, but I've made some tweaks to the protocol, uh, made a few additions. So you might want to stay tuned for that um, next week when I, you know, really talk about the science be behind hydrating the hair to let you have a, a good understanding of how to do it so that you can reproduce the results and why you use specific ingredients and, and how you do the actual method. So I'll be going into that next week. Okay, everyone. So I've enabled the Q&A. And I'll leave it open for a few minutes if you have any questions. So I've just done... I'm just gonna do a, a really unscientific poll. What I'm asking is, have any of you used the max hydration method? If you can, if you take the time to just answer yes or no, and I'll just kind of tally up the, the votes here. But in the meantime, ask your questions if you have any. I don't see any. Okay. Okay, got one in, no. No. Okay, I've got a question here. Thank you very much. Yes, I love it. Okay, awesome. So someone answered that yes, they love the max hydration method. One has and two have not. And so my perspective is hair is different. So it's gonna respond differently to different methods, et cetera. So the max hydration method works for you. I say continue to use it. I just wanted you to be aware of what was in the method and why it was working and why you might need to do a little, a few tweaks to it if you're not getting the result that you want and how, and next week I'll talk about how you can incorporate Earth Tones Naturals products into the method if you are currently using them or even if you're not using them. Okay, so we'll make a few additions and tweaks here and there. All right, three have not. So most people have not used the max hydration method and one person has and loves it. And I'm going to ask for the person who 
loves it. What is your hair type? And are you low or are you high porosity? Okay, I'll just keep the questions open for another minute or so. And then I will send you all off to do what you need to do, whether it's bed, taking care of kids, or watching TV, whatever it is. Okay, so um, <laughs> thank you. So for the attendee that used it, she has no idea what her hair type and texture is and if she's low or high porosity, but she just knows that she loves it. So with fine hair, using too many that the hair down. However, it just depends on what types of products you're using. So if you're using really heavy creams, heavy butters, heavy thick oils, then yes, that can definitely lead to wear, weighing your hair down. If you're using lighter oils, lighter gels, lighter conditioners, then there's a less risk of those products weighing your hair down than using the heavier products. So you just have to kind of know what types of products to use for your hair. Did you give a formula for using the products to the max hydration method. Did I give a formula? Can you can you clarify your question? So someone asked, did I give a formula for using the products on the max hydration method? So just clarify what you're what you mean so I can answer it. Okay, any other questions, any other comments? I know there's probably a little bit of a lag with asking the questions, so I'm just going to wait. Okay, percentages of each product. No, they don't give percentages of each product. They just give basically like one to two ounces and four to six ounces. I think with this formula or with this, um, with this protocol, it's kind of subjective, meaning you do what works for your hair. So if you do, you know, if you start with the basics of, you know, one to two, one to two and a half ounces of conditioner and four to six ounces of water, and you find that maybe there's not enough slip to the conditioner on your hair, then you might increase the concentration or the amount of conditioner in your hair. So it's not precise. It really is not precise. It's more of a general idea of how much conditioner, how much water, how much apple cider vinegar, how much baking soda you want to use. And the reason is, is that there's, a lot of this stuff has not really been studied. So, you know, there's no formal study to show that, okay, if you put 60 grams of baking soda in, you know, 150 mLs of water, you're gonna get such and such effect. So it's kind of trial and error, do it yourself type thing here. So that's why. And then when it comes to the approved products, there are already products that are manufactured. So there's gels that are manufactured, although some people do their flaxseed gel. I'm not a big fan of flaxseed gel. When I first started formulating um, products, the curl enhancing jelly, it had flaxseed gel in it with some other ingredients. And I found that it would just, it just flaked too much and it really didn't give the great hold um, that I wanted. So I, I I just don't formulate with flaxseed gel. Some people love it, and it just is a—it's a certain type and hair type and texture that can use flaxseed gel, and their hair can really spiral and curl up from flaxseed gel. But for my hair, no, I need something a lot thicker. All right, everyone, thank you so much for attending. This will be join me next week for the rehydration protocol. Yes, it's a seven day challenge. I've had this challenge for you know over a year now, but I'm gonna be doing some tweaks to it uh, just to make it a little bit better than what it is right now. So uh, join me next week for that. Thank you everyone and have a fantastic night.